Hi there. I am so happy you chose to worship God with us here at the Cloverdale Seventh-day Adventist Church. I invite you to allow the presence of God to fill you up. Also, if you are desiring to support the cause of Christ uh, through your kind generosity, or maybe you have some questions, please feel free to visit our website at uh, Cloverdale. Dot org. How often do we get to celebrate the Sabbath on a Christmas day? Not very often, right? <laughs> the day that we celebrate Jesus Christ. Every Sabbath we get to celebrate Him as Creator. Today we celebrate Him as Creator and Redeemer. Amen? It's a good day. It's the day God has made and we can rejoice in it. Nothing wrong with celebrating. I welcome you this morning, Merry Christmas, to our worship service, Saints of Cloverdale. And also those of you online, we are delighted to have you worship with us this morning and uh, rejoice in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Creator. Who would have ever thought? Who would have ever thought? Who would have ever thought that the Creator could be a single cell and born as a human. You've got to think different. God always thinks different. Thinks different than we do. He always has a way to make it happen, to really strengthen what goes on on this planet because He wants us back. Pray with me. Father, You are the one who is the giver of all good gifts. In you there is no shadow of turning. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we meet here today, on this day we celebrate the birth of your Son and our Redeemer. We thank you that we can be part of your great plan, your great design to be redeemed from the planet back to your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today is the 82nd Christmas of my life. The first three I don't remember. <laughs> but the, the starting with my fourth year Christmas became a special time of the year for me. You know, it was all kids, right? Christmas is always a special time. As a kid, it was all about getting presents. As maturity set in, getting began to moderate a little bit into giving. But I was deeply infected by a virus of selfishness. And so it was kind of, you know, different. A, con a contest going on inside of my spirit. You have it too, right? We're all infected with this huge virus and it's vicious. It will take your life if it's not removed. You've all, we've all been condemned to a terminal illness unless God removes the virus from our life. We think we can make it different, make it better. No, only God can. We have to trust Him. He'll take care of it. I've been a pastor for 57 years, and I'm still growing, and I continue to learn about Jesus and grow in my relationship with Him. December 25 is a reminder, a reminder Without him, I can do nothing. Why else would God send his, his partner, the creator, as an infant, if it wasn't important? Now we know that December 25 is not the actual birth date of Jesus. I mean, you can read it even on all of the documents that are out now. It'll tell you that. We know that. But what we do know is that he was born here on this earth. And he was here to be with us. That's why he was born here as a human, to be with us. That was God's hunger. God gave him to us. It is his nature to give for the benefit of his creation. John 3, 16, for God so loved, right? He gives to those who believe in him as well as those who do not believe in him. Even those who deny he exists, he gives to them. Matthew 5 makes that clear. He gives 
the sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. So when Adam and Eve chose to go it alone, without God, and they immediately experienced guilt, shame, and fear. Do not forget those three words, guilt, shame, and fear. You have experienced it already in your own life. I have. Whenever we choose to go alone without God, that's what we experience, and that is not from God, that's from the enemy. Because if you have those three experiences, you kind of pull away from God. That's what Adam and Eve did. They were afraid of God when he showed up in the garden. God's anger was toward what Satan had done to his family, not angry with his family, as some people are teaching today. He was so upset by the human family, he had to send his son so he can punish him, not us. That's not the case. It was God's love that brought us together. In fact, he was, his coming was made known in the Garden of Eden. By the way, did you know that the word Eden really means pleasure? That's what the word itself means. God created a garden of pleasure for Adam and Eve. The place that God designed for pleasure became the place where Adam and Eve made a decision to turn Eden into the place of failure and loss. It was not his plan, not his design. And in Genesis 3, we know the text, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring, her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The Lord says, I will put enmity. I will put enmity between you and the woman. I want you to notice that it is not natural for us to have enmity. Only God brings that on. Notice this quote from Science of the Times July 11, 1895, the enmity does not exist as a natural fact. As soon as Adam sinned, he was in harmony with the first great apostate. Hmm. As soon as he sinned, in harmony with the enemy. And at war with God. And if God had not interfered in man's behalf, Satan and man would have formed a confederacy against heaven and carried on united opposition against the God of hosts. There is no natural enmity between evil angels and evil men. Both are evil through transgression of the law of God. And evil will always league against good. Fallen men and fallen angels enter into a desperate companionship. That paragraph shocked me when I read it. I don't know what it does to you, but we are in a serious battle on planet Earth. And God is willing to give everything up to bring it close in our own lives and get us back into his family. To be able to give back, to bring healing from the infection had been planned before our creator created this world. Did you know that? Because Revelation 13 tells us he is the lamb slain from the, from the foundation of the earth. Before there was ever a failure on planet earth, Jesus had agreed, I will go and give my life if necessary for them. There was great and hopeful expectation of the coming of the Messiah Deliverer, but time passed and there was no indication he was about to arrive. In fact, the prophets were silent for 400 years between the time of Malachi and the time of Matthew. No written word. They were silent. But they had the writings and they read the writings. They were familiar with them. But one generation after generation passes the scene. Hope fades as problems arise. Invasion by a foreign pagan government into God's government. The church seemed to act in ways they had no, ha no indication of his coming. The Jewish leaders used fear and coercion to keep the believers in line. Wicked kings... Corrupt priests and oppressive Pharisees continued to dim the promise of the deliverance. But now, the time had come. A year ago, almost to this day, I shared a sermon with you. In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. That time had now come when it looked like the church was over, the world was done, and God said, go, son, let's go, let's start. Jesus' birth announcement 
was promised to humble shepherds whose status was slightly better than tax collectors and prostitutes. The priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees knew all about the coming of the Messiah. They had been reading about it for years in the prophetic scrolls. <laughs> One little book in the Bible, Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from the old, of old, from everlasting. Oh, they knew it. They read it regularly. Another one, Isaiah 7. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Oh, yeah. They knew he was coming. They also designed the agenda for the Messiah. Yeah. So when you come, we've got it all figured out for you. We've got the whole schedule worked out. When he came, they would inform him. They would guide him in how he was to put Israel as the head of all the nations of the earth. That was their plan. But was that God's plan? Somehow we have to learn to think different. They thought one way. God thought another but notice the angel did not show up in the temple. He did not show up in the study halls of theologians. He showed up in the open fields where the shepherds cared for the sheep. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Who would the angels appear to if Christ were to come for the first time today? What do you think they would appear? He enters the world as one of us. Have you ever wondered what it must have been like in heaven when the plan for Jesus to become one with the sinful race, leave heaven and be born as a human baby to live in this sin-degraded world? Did you ever wonder what the angels were thinking? And this was God's plan. But had they been informed that uh, he was going to become one of the sinful race? I don't know. The angels had been watching how the humans had become so degraded from the way God had created Adam and Eve. They watched them go downhill from being created to live forever to being completely physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually destroyed. And when that happened, Jesus was leaving heaven to come here to be one of us. Emmanuel, God with us. How about that? It didn't make sense. But then God and Jesus told them they were on a rescue mission to get the human family back. That was good news. Think different. Who would have ever thought that God would become a part of this race in this degraded state? Maybe as Adam and Eve, yes, but mm, not after 4,000 years of sin degradation. Hmm. But Jesus was not born into power, privilege, or pleasure. God did not send his son to be raised by kings and queens and the rulers of this earth. Instead, he was born to peasants. Think different. And the good news was first proclaimed to common shepherds on the night shift. Who would have thought? God was in charge of Jesus' conception and birth. Even the long trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, he guided Joseph and Mary to a special place for the birth of his son. What do you mean, guided? It looked like he had completely failed them. They showed up in Bethlehem, but there was no place for him. That's what it says in the Word, right? No room in the inn. Hmm. As I mentioned earlier, I keep learning and am amazed at how God, how I missed what God reveals. The Word of God tells us things that sometimes we just gloss over because we've heard the story so many times we miss some of the small things, the short sentences, the concepts. I keep learning. I will say to you that this last week, I was exposed to something I had never seen before in my life by a friend of mine that I will share with you this morning. 
about the birth. You have in your mind something similar to this when you think about the birth of Jesus, right? Hang on. Micah, the minor prophet, revealed it in one verse, a difference. Now, we know Micah 5, 2. That's very familiar to all of us. It goes like this. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. But what about Micah chapter 4, verses 6 to 8? Let's read those. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast, and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation. Talking about Israel. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now and even more and, and even forevermore. Verse 8, and you, O tower of the flock, don't forget that little phrase, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of, daughter, of the daughter of Jerusalem. And that last phrase, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom. The Messiah will bring the kingdom. Didn't, isn't that what it was said in Matthew? Jesus said, the kingdom is near. The kingdom has come. Of the daughter of Jerusalem. Who's the daughter of Jerusalem? That's the mother of Jesus. Mary. The tower, this tower of the flock, mentioned in Micah 4.8, in the Hebrew is Migdal Eder. You say, so what? <laughs> so what, Migdal Eder? What does that mean? It literally means watchtower of the flock. What I want to share with you changes, has changed my view of what God was up to when he sent his son. God, God works by design. He does not work by accident. The Messiah, Jesus, would be born at Migdal Adar. You said, no, 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 he's born in Bethlehem. That is Bethlehem. The tower of the flock is right next to the city. So what is this watchtower of the flock? It is a manger. It's a stall for animals. But the question is, what animals? What animals are in this tower of the flock? And what I've learned this past week is exciting. Filled with hope and faith building. In fact, I have so much stuff I've been working on this now. I stayed up late, put stuff in, took it out, because if I took all the time to explain the background, we'd be here till about 2 o'clock. I can do that. Just ask my wife. <laughs> this will build hope. This tower is not the manger behind the inn. Not like this. In fact, the manger behind the inn was not like this either. Not at all. Cooper Abrams III states in his article, Migdal Adar in Jerusalem, the following. The watchtower from ancient times was used by the shepherds for the protection from their enemies and wild beasts. It was also the place used were safely brought to give birth to the lambs. Follow closely. In this shelter building cave, the priests would bring in the youths which were about to lamb for protection. These special lambs came from a unique flock that was designated for sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. Hang on to this now, because we're going to come back to a passage of Scripture in Luke 2 that tells us all this, but we never picked it up before. That's all. The shepherds who kept them were men who were specifically trained for this royal task. They were educated in what an animal that was to be sacrificed had to be, and it was their job to make sure that none of the animals were hurt, damaged, or blemished. And this flock, from this flock, these lambs were apparently wrapped, watch this, these lambs were apparently wrapped in swaddling clothes to protect them from injury and also were used to wrap the Lord Jesus. Are you on board with me? They would then be placed in a stone feeding trough to protect them from any kind of injury until the priest took the lamb, 
for the sacrifice. God does not work by accident. He works by design, and there is the type meets antitype. And if we would just pay attention, he lets us know ahead of time what he's going to do. We can rejoice that we have a God who does not get caught off guard with anything. In my uh, theological studies, I, had not, I do not ever remember having it pointed out that Migdal Adar is the place of the birth of Jesus. Now, it may have been taught in the class. Maybe I was asleep. I don't know, but I don't ever remember this happening. Why is it that most of us have never heard of Migdal Adar? How many have heard of Migdal Adar, Adar before this morning? Hmm? It's in Micah. Just a chapter before Micah 5, which we all know well. We've heard time and time again during the Christmas season. Let alone in reference to the birth of Jesus, we can thank Emperor Constantine and his wife, his mother, Helena, for the erroneous selection of the site of Jesus' birth. The church was led astray in the 4th century A.D. and has since steadfastly supported the traditional site of the cave under the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus. Louise and I have been there. When we are in the Holy Land, everybody goes to the Church of the Nativity. It is crowded. It is decorated. It is something else to walk into. And they lead you right up to a special spot in this Church of the Nativity. It is protected. There is a little hole on top. And you can reach your hand down inside there and touch the spot, they say, where Jesus was born. Not so? Not so. I did not know until this last week the difference. What do we do? As I said, I give credit to Cooper P. Abrams III for his article, Where Was the Birthplace of the Lord Jesus? And I studied this this week. I discovered that there are all kinds of researchers, all kinds of Bible students who use this man's material. So he's done the research. You may know of a man named Edersheim. He has written a book that uh, Desire of Ages reflects. It took seven years for him to write that book. Sometime you ought to dig it out and read it. Oh, you can. It's in Desire of Ages. Many of the concepts are there. So, typically, Abram states, typically Migdal Adar, the tower of the flock at Bethlehem, is the perfect place for Christ to be born. Follow his reasoning now. He was born in the very birthplace of tens of thousands of lambs. Are you on board? He was born in place which had been sacrificed to prefigure him. God promised it, he pictured it, and performed it at Migdal Eder. It all fits together, for that's the place where sacrificial lambs were born. Who is Jesus? Hmm? We have the text coming up very shortly. Jesus was not born behind an inn in a smelly stable where the donkeys and other animals of travelers were kept. He was born in Bethlehem. At the birthing place of the sacrificial lambs that were offered in the temple in Jerusalem, which Micah 4.8 calls the tower of the flock. That ought to excite your hearts to know that God did not abandon his son en route from Nazareth to Bethlehem to be put in a smelly, abandoned cave where animals were. He knew exactly what he was doing. She became pregnant in the right time so that when the registration took place by the Roman government, she would be in Bethlehem. And there had already been established then the place of the tower of the flock where the lambs for sacrifice were brought to be protected. And that's where God said, go. That's why there was no room in the inn. Not a mistake. It was a plan. And by the way, the inn was not like in the end that we know. This was a huge place where the caravans would come. The rooms faced the courtyard. And there was no room in the inn. You know why? This was a time for registration. All the caravans of everywhere were coming to this place and they were going into the, into the inns and there was no room anywhere. Think God would know that? 
Sure you knew it. I've got a place for my son. I've got a place for this mother of Jesus and her husband to go. It's going to be clean and safe. Not a mistake. It was a plan. Now, let's read from Luke 2 some familiar verses with this background. Beginning at verse 8. Now, and we know this passage has been read every Christmas. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. By the way, most versions of Scripture have the word flocks, plural. So I said to myself, why, were there, why should there be many flocks? This is one flock. So I looked it up in the original to find out if it was plural or singular. What do you think I found? Singular. Singular. Not multiple flocks. One flock. This is a special flock. This was a designated flock. This group was designed to bring the lambs for the sacrifice. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and they were greatly afraid. These shepherds. Now, these were special shepherds, by the way. They were trained specifically for the job. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. This is good news, he says. <laughs> Pay attention, guys. Don't be afraid. This is good news for everybody. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The next phrases, and this shall be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's the sign. That's the signal. This is the one. Then the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. <laughs> and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Really? Why would they marvel? But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She did. What did she ponder in her heart? Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. I'm going to go back now and unpack just a few phrases here. The babe, they said, the sign to you will be a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. But the angels never told them where the manger was. Why not? Because they already knew. They knew what the sign was. They had put lambs in there. They had wrapped them in swaddling clothes. And, and the angel says, you know where to go. To the tower of the flock. That's where you'll find him. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then we have this phrase. And all those who heard it, that is in town, you know, I mean, the shepherds, these guys who are kind of the lowest part of society, they're coming around in the city and saying, guess what, guys? Guess what? The Messiah has been born. He is in the tower of the flock, wrapped in swaddling clothes, just like the sacrificial lambs. Why else would they be marveling at those things, the shepherds told them? Hmm? Why else? Then, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. What is going on in Mary's heart? <laughs> you know the song, Mary, did you know? Did you know? Yeah, she's pondering them. This is the Messiah. He is a lamb for the sins of the world. And that's where we come to John 1, 29. John's in the river, baptizing. Jesus is coming down the path. He's never seen Jesus before. This is his cousin, but he's never seen him before. And as he comes down the path, John stops his baptizing and he says, Look, look, this is the Lamb of God who, came, who takes away the sin of the world. You get the phrase? This is God's Lamb. God's Lamb. What was it Abram said to his son Isaac when Isaac asked, Where's the Lamb? 
And Abram says, God will provide. And John says, this is God's lamb. Notice the language, it's a lamb. They knew what it meant. They knew what it meant when he said that. Because the lambs had been sacrificed over and over again. And they had been protected in the tower of the flock, just like Jesus had been. The Bible is the revelation of God restoring what was lost by Adam and Eve due to the controversy between Satan and Jesus. So John's announcement at the river Jordan that Jesus is God's lamb to remove sin from the world, to remove our sin, yours and mine. It has been removed by the lamb in the tower of the flock, Jesus Christ. In our scripture reading today, God says, I don't think the way you think. The way you work isn't the way I work. That's my decree. For as the sky soars high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work, and the way I think is beyond the way you think. Don't you like a God who thinks beyond us? <laughs> I tell you what, if he wasn't thinking this through and had it already worked out, we'd be in a mess right now. But we're not. We're not. He sent his son to be the lamb for the world. You and me. It is time for us to think different. God acts from a plan. He acts from a design that had already put in place before he created the world. He knows exactly what he is doing. We can trust him to bring it to fulfillment in ways we have not even thought of. Think different. From God's point of view, the coming of Jesus is about being with us. That's what he says, right? You call him Emmanuel. God with us. That's what God wants, to be with us, healing us and giving to us. It's about getting to. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, it's about getting to. That is getting us into a new life where there is no death, no pain, no tears. God said it, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. He says, think different. Israel, both the priests, scribes, Pharisees and the king, along with most of the people, believed that when the Messiah arrived, he would overpower the Romans. He would destroy their armies and throw them out of the land of Canaan, then set up a new government over Judaism. They were convinced this was Jehovah's plan. But I say, think different. So does God. Think different. God showed up as a baby born to a peasant family. Did it catch the devil off guard? I don't know. He lived to bring joy to others. The Messiah's kingdom had a different foundation. The principles of his kingdom were stunning. Rather than destroying your enemies and throwing them out, he said, but love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't resist an evil person. If they sue you for your coat, let them have your suit also. Blessed are the peacemakers. Always go the extra mile. Turning the whole plan upside down, God says, think different. In fact, every Advent season, we focus on a baby in a manger and forget that he grew up and became a man who focused on getting his kingdom into us and getting the virus of death out of us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As we continue to move through the Advent season, keep in mind that God's plan to conquer was not to smash the enemy with his power. Not to smash his enemy with his power, which he could have done. No. But to neutralize his deceptive power with truth, love, and freedom versus guilt, shame, and fear. That's how he thought different. Not the normal way, but a way that was totally different for the benefit of his human family. Jesus Christ, your creator, my creator, left highest realm of heaven and became one of us. He demanded nothing and gave up everything, even the privilege to act in the power of God. I will become a human. I will use only my humanity to live here in this planet for you. For me, for we can became, become part of his flock forever. 
He came to our world as one of us. That is love. That is God. If you think you are not enough, not good enough for Jesus' love and forgiveness, think different. Think different. Jesus is in solidarity with you. Jesus loves you just the way you are, no matter what you've done or where you come from. He will transform you. He will transform you because He is your Creator. He can do that. Jesus came to save you, came to save me. This is why we worship God, because He came to redeem us. We worship God not out of fear, but out of love and thankfulness. Luke tells us that 2,000 or so years ago, there were shepherds keeping watch over the flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. We just read it a while ago. And the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for everybody. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Do you not understand? Do we, co- do we copy what he says? Think different. <laughs> Bethlehem. You want to see another plan, a design of God? Bethlehem? You know what Bethlehem is, don't you? It's made up of two words. Bethlehem. The word Beth means house. And the word Lahem means bread. House of bread. Bethlehem was selected by God, purposely set up Mary to be there at the right time because Jesus is to be the bread of life for the world. Your trust in God My trust in God can be deepened and strengthened with the realization that God is not just playing games. He has planned it from the very beginning to the very end, and He will bring it off. We just trust Him. Trust Him. So the Master is going to give you a sign anyway. Watch for this. A girl who is presently a virgin will get pregnant. She'll bear a son and name him Emmanuel. God with us. Christ became a human to erase our loneliness, our fear, our dread. His life, a bright light for everyone. (laughs) The shepherds, haven't forgotten them. They're still there. The lowly, disrespected shepherds, they were the very first human beings to spread the good news about Jesus Christ. You, You understand that? It wasn't the priests, it wasn't the Pharisees, it wasn't the scribes, it wasn't the theologians. It were the shepherds outside who took care of the flock. They were the ones. And they spread the good news about Jesus Christ. And the people responded to their message. They had been loved. And so they loved God right away, right back. Think different. What would happen if we just shared the good news that God loves? That's why He came to be with us. Come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. I realize I just sang the wrong song. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Pray with me. Oh, Father. Great and mighty in all your ways. There is no other God like you. In fact, there is no other God. When you planned from the beginning, if man should fail, you would not fail. And here we are, Father, before you, your sons and daughters. We accept 
your plan, your design through your Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. Now to him who is able to save us and to protect us from everything, may he be with you and you walk with him from now until Jesus comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. Amen. I hope you were blessed by today's message. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you or for you, please feel free to contact us. May God bless you and keep you till we meet again.